Hey, everybody. The question for today is one that is certainly relevant to something that a lot of younger people in the church are grappling with right now, and that is trying to make sense of the church's policy and doctrine as it pertains to gender, specifically with LGBTQIA+, etc. members. Uh, what are the rules? What are the guidelines? Have they changed over time? What's going on? We're going to unpack that a little bit later. First, I want to begin with a story that can serve as a backdrop for this question. This story bubbled up in social media in the past few weeks. It's about a year and a half or so old. It's a story of Lauren Harigian, uh, who is a new convert to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, five years ago, Lauren, who uh, was a man, is in my estimation a man, but presenting as uh, a woman and wanting to be a woman, Lauren legally changed uh, his name, his gender. Here's a photo of what Lauren looks like. Uh, by his own admission, has an eating disorder, depression, gender dysphoria, panic attacks. Inter interestingly, is a therapist uh, helping other LGBT individuals of all ages, gay allied, intersex allied, lesbian allied, non-binary, open relationships, non-monogamy, and on and on and on. In 2018, Lauren began going through hormonal therapy and in 2022 was baptized, as you can see here in this photo, into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as a woman. Now, we learned a little bit about Lauren from a couple interviews done by Richard Osler, who is the author of Listen, Learn, and Love, Embracing LGBTQ Latter-day Saints. He's also a host of a podcast that goes by the same name, uh, which is where we learn a bit about Lauren. Now, in the beginning of the first interview, uh, Osler starts out by saying that Lauren, though a man, trying to present and, and act as a woman, is in fact a woman. Let's take a listen. My guest on today's podcast is a new convert to the church, and Lauren is a transgender Latter-day Saint. It is obviously a woman, transgender woman. I'm going to use he, her. I'm her. Um, sorry about that, her pronouns. We're going to get into some of the questions a little bit later, uh, one of them being, are sister missionaries allowed to meet alone with a man who thinks he's a woman, can elders meet alone with uh, a woman who thinks she's a man and vice versa and on and on. Here's Lauren talking about the sister missionaries uh, visiting alone with uh, him as he was going through the discussions. Did you transition at that point? Is that why sister missionaries came because you're a sister? Yes. Lauren's story stems from this next clip that we're going to listen to where Lauren claims that he's listed on the records of the church as a female. You're baptized as a female, so if you're, it shows female on your record, correct? Yeah, on my, on my app and everything. Yeah. yeah, so LDS Tools, it has your gender as female. Now, after this interview was done, there were a lot of questions, there was a lot of buzz online because people are like, wait a minute, you know, this trans uh, woman, a man, uh, wanting to be a woman, was listed by the church, apparently, uh, in Lauren's own estimation or, or claim. Uh, as a woman on the records of the church. That created, as you might imagine, a lot of buzz online. Like, wait a minute, is this a new thing? What's going on? In response to a lot of questions, uh, Richard Osler had Lauren back on the podcast a few episodes later to answer a bunch of questions that uh, arose from the previous discussion. Uh, here's a, a clip talking about how Lauren doesn't want to be considered a trans woman, just wants to be seen as what he thinks he is, which is just a woman. You probably don't want to... You called a transgender woman. You just want to be called a woman. Why? I mean, that's who I am. And I, you know, everything about me, not just the whole medical portion of it, but within my soul, within my whole being is even people who are like my close, close friend, that's all they see. They don't, they're not like, oh my gosh, my trans friend. No, my friend, Lauren, who is a really fun girl. Now in this next clip, I find this very interesting. Uh, Brother Osler is talking about how he and other saints should perceive Lauren, uh, given his desire to be a woman. I think that's one of the things we can do as grace as members of the church is just see you as a daughter of God, because that's the way you see you. And I'm going to see you the way you see you. Yeah. I'm not going to define you based on anything but how you're defining you. That just seems like the gospel of grace or the gospel of kindness, the gospel of love. 
interesting here, of course, that it's not how God sees Lauren. It's not how Lauren actually is. Uh, it's just how Lauren self perceives, and therefore we should all go along with that and see him as a daughter of God. Uh, in this next clip, uh, Lauren reaffirms what he had said on the previous interview, and that he's in fact listed on the church records as a female. I noticed some of the questions were, "What does your membership own?" As you just said, like, and you can have it right here, like, and it says female on the membership tools. And then Lauren was presented this question about resurrection. Does Lauren think that he's going to be resurrected as a woman, as a man? How does that work? Here's what Lauren had to say. So somebody said, well, this is all fine and dandy, but you're going to get resurrected as a man. Um, talk about that comment. And I'm sorry to ask you that. No. Yeah. I think for me, I mean, and of course, you know, we can't think about, you know, we can't feel each other's feelings or what any of each other thinking or doing just because you know we're not as fun or not fun it would be like i wish we were in a marvel movie but we're not <laughs> while i will say for me my feeling and has always been this way and those who have who are my true friends know they don't see me any other way as that other gender they all see me as female and my inner being, my embodiment, even before I transition, has always been female. I love that. So it sounds like your hope and feeling and is since you're a woman that you'll be a woman in the next life. Okay, now the thing to understand about Lauren's situation is that this is not necessarily unique. This is not an anomaly. There are many other instances and stories of LGBTQ type people navigating the church and navigating disparate uh, outcomes when it comes to how they can interact with and worship in the church. Here's an article from The Exponent Online talking about my first day in Relief Society, a man who was acting as a woman and says, Socially transitioning to present as female was a deliberate step for me to take after receiving direction through prayer to do so. I know that this transition, this fundamental change in my life is the right path for me. I know through much prayer that I'm not giving up on eternity by taking this path I've been directed to, finding joys I never knew were possible. Here's a story of a woman transitioning to be a man. Uh, now known as Emmett, claiming that uh, she had a, a loving bishop, though one who was unable to secure approval, apparently, to list her instead as a man uh, in, in the church records. Let's take a listen. I even had a bishop tell me that he received confirmation that my spirit is a male. And that was amazing. It was just incredible to me. And of course, I, you know, have not been able to hold the priesthood. I had a bishop who, after I got my name and my gender marker legally changed, he was able to change my name in the church records to Emmett Michael Clarence, but the church would not let him change my gender marker. So in the church records, it still says that I am female. And so the, my bishop, you know, he talked to church headquarters to see if we could change that. If I needed to be rebaptized as Emmett or, or what I need to do. And long story short, there was nothing that could be done uh, at that point. This was just a couple of years ago. And he was like, you know, if, if I could give you the priesthood, I would, because you're worthy. So basically I did everything by the book. And when I had, um, I had my surgeries, top surgery, and a, a, an emergency hysterectomy, hysterectomy, and I was never disciplined for any of that. But overall, it was a very good experience. We'll get to the questions again in a minute. Another one of them being, what do we do with this bishop roulette situation where some bishops, some clerks, some stake presidents are in fact listing an individual with their assumed and desired gender identity, but not their actual gender. Um, and we have these, again, these disparate outcomes. 
Here's another example from Blair Osler. No apparent relation to Richard Osler, the person who interviewed Lauren mentioned earlier. Uh, Blair self-describes as a queer Mormon, says that she experiences sexual attraction and desire towards a diversity of genders, says that my queer agenda is to live in a world where radical love is recognized and encouraged. This includes, but is not limited to, the acceptance of diverse sexual identities, orientations, and marital practices, including plural mar marriages and relationships. In an article titled Living in Silence, Blair says, and I quote, I will not be silenced into submission. My heavenly parents gave me a voice for a reason, and that reason is to spread the gospel of love. My voice has grown in the last five years, and I'm not afraid to admit that I have struggled with anxiety, depression, and suicide ideation. I'm no longer afraid of who I am, what I've been through, and what these experiences have done to me. I'm not ashamed to say I was the victim of ecclesiastical and spiritual abuse, and abusers need to be held accountable for the damage they cause. The brethren need to be held accountable. From a study of LDS members who are navigating all this LGBT stuff, 18-year-old uh, Beth, a pseudonym, uh, Beth says, and I quote, I absolutely know that nothing about me is a mistake. I absolutely know that people can change and people are capable of love. And I absolutely know that the divine, however you want to see that, however you want to see that divinity, cannot be limited and should not be limited when it comes to gender identity. God is not limited to male or female. Because the divine is all-encompassing, it's an all-encompassing love and an all-encompassing power that you can sit with and you can adapt to yourself however you want and that you can find strength in. Of course, this is doctrinal nonsense. This is total rubbish trying to make God in the image of man to suit you know one's own desires. And yet, these are the perceptions of a lot of younger members of the church uh, that we'll share a little bit more about going forward. Again, there are going to be many more examples like this of people trying to fuse their religion and their confusion and their mental illness and their gender dysphoria and other things that they're navigating um, as they try to figure out their place uh, in the church and what it all means. So let's get into a few questions. One of them mentioned earlier, is it appropriate for Lauren, a man presenting as a woman, to visit alone with sister missionaries? Now, this comes from the kind of code of conduct, the rules for missionaries, and it says to limit physical contact with someone of the opposite gender to a handshake. Here's that photo again of Lauren uh, from his baptism, buddy-buddy uh, doing more than a handshake with uh, the sister missionaries there. The rules continue to say, always ensure that another adult of your own gender is present with you and your companion when you visit in person, teach in person, travel with or have meals with an individual of the opposite gender. Seek approval from your mission president for any exceptions. Now, of course, talking about the opposite gender, how are we talking? Is it, is it self-perceived gender, self-proclaimed gender? Is it actual gender? Is it okay for the sister missionaries to be teaching alone in an individual's home, a man who is claiming to be a woman? Does that satisfy the rules that that is their same gender and therefore that's okay? Well, this has some significance because there are a lot of so-called trans women, men who are presenting as women, uh, who are causing a lot of problems. Of course, the big headlines is the sports and all the problems uh, being caused there. But a, a more tragic headline, I think, is women's prisons, where men who are claiming to be uh, women are sentenced to and sent to uh, women's prison and they uh, commit all kinds of sexual abuse and physical abuse against uh, the women in that prison. Here's a, f a few recent headlines. A uh, trans woman guilty of raping two women remanded in federal in, in female prison. Another one, man posing as transgender woman raped female prisoner. Another one, a New Jersey trans prisoner who impregnated two inmates transferred to men's facility. So this question of whether it's okay for a man to be alone with two sister missionaries simply because the, because the man is claiming to be a woman this seems like uh, there needs to be some resolution, some, some revision uh, to the church's rules, because at least in Lauren's case, Lauren met alone with the sister missionaries. Another question that arises, uh, can a boy who claims to be a girl join young women's camp and share a tent or a cabin? 
with the other girls. I have a 12 year old, almost 13 year old daughter. When she's at young women's camp, uh, if, if there's a, a boy who says that he's a, a girl, is he going to be permitted to, you know, be in her tent or in her, her cabin? Uh, can a guy who's kind of LARPing or role playing as a woman simply because he wore makeup and a dress join Relief Society or use the women's restroom in the chapel, uh, enter these these women's spaces simply to appease the dysphoria, the mental illness and the challenges that an individual is going through, but allow those women's spaces to be invaded? Another question is, is will the definition of woman be muddied uh, by church members in an effort to claim that men who identify as a w woman are, uh, are actually a woman. Uh, you've probably seen Matt Walsh's documentary that he did, What is a Woman? It's definitely worth watching because so many of these people that were interviewed, so many people in our society who buy into this ideology, this gender ideology, cannot answer the question. They give a tautological or circular response. Well, a woman is, is you know, whoever believes they're a woman. Uh, and, and they're unable to do that. Well, are members of the church going to get sucked into that ideological confusion and in an effort to be so-called loving or affirming, they're going to buy into the ideology, start using the terminology, start making concessions, start changing their mindset uh, as a result to fit in, to not alienate. But what's going to happen in the church if people are embracing or muddying this definition of, of what a woman actually is? Um, and, and, and should a trans person uh, be allowed to be baptized if gender is, as the proclamation says, part of one's pre-mortal and post-mortal and mortal identity, if it's this inherent part of our, our humanity and our divinity, if someone is trying to live in rebellion against that, is, is that not unlike a, a smoker, right, who's required to give up smoking before being baptized or an unmarried couple? Uh, that has to get married before getting baptized so they're not living in fornication or, you know, you have to live the law of chastity and so forth. Uh, we're, we're all sinners. We all have problems. We're all in rebellion against God. But it's been clear that the baptismal rules require someone living in open uh, unrighteousness and a, a situation that's inherently problematic uh, needs to repent, needs to change prior to baptism. And so the question is, if someone notwithstanding some gender dysphoria and other things going on, but if they're, if they're having surgery, if they're socially transitioning and so forth, why are we treating people differently like Lauren, who did it before they were a member, versus someone like Emmett, who was currently a member, right? You have these mixed responses simply based on whether the person was already a member or not. What if Emmett were to leave the church, right? Remove uh, her records from the church. And then transition, would Emmett then be able to be baptized and listed on the records, in her case as a man, just like Lauren, uh, in his case, was listed as a woman? A lot of these questions, right? And if Lauren is to be believed about his records being marked female, uh, that's an interesting issue that raises all kinds of questions. If, if, if Lauren, a man presenting as and claiming to be a woman, is listed on the church's records indeed as a female, then... Here's a question. Could Lori, uh, Lauren marry a man and remain in good standing with the church? If the church says, yes, Lauren, you are female, then can Lauren, who's a man, marry a man, but Lauren thinks that he's a female. The church says that he's a female, and so that's a female-male marriage, even though Lauren is really a man. So would the church be okay? So now Lauren's a, a baptized member in good standing. Yes, being trans has some limitations on, uh, you know, priesthood, temple, and things like that. But from the church's perspective, would it be completely appropriate for Lauren uh, to be married and uh, therefore not experience any church membership restrictions or anything by entering into a marriage with a man? Uh, because from the church's perspective, apparently that's a female, male marriage, which marriage is between a man and a woman legally and lawfully wedded. So if the church is, is assuming these new genders, at least in Lauren's case, we're taking Lauren's word for it, claiming that, you know, the LDS Tools app shows that, um, and uh, there may be other such situations that I don't know about and that we'll learn about at some future time. But again, if, if the marriage thing kind of throws this this off a little bit. Or could Lauren call himself, because he's uh, apparently a woman, could he call himself a lesbian, uh, publicly state as much, and then marry a woman? 
but the church wouldn't maybe mind because Lauren's actually a man marrying a woman. And so, so the church has to figure that out, right? Uh, is, is it okay with Lauren, a man marrying a woman, uh, excuse me, marrying a man because the church says that he's female or if Lauren were to marry a woman and Lauren thinks that he's a woman, therefore thinks that this is a lesbian marriage. But then the church is like, yeah, we're calling you female, but you're actually a man. And so therefore that's a marriage between a man and a woman. Like this is going to cause so many problems if there isn't a clear resolution and a firm doctrinal position. We're going to get into later how that position is ebbing and flowing and going to cause some problems for the church. Here's the broader issue. Take a look at this chart. Only 78, this is according to a study done of like tens of thousands of college students across the country. They segmented based on all kinds of demographics and here in this chart by religion. Only 78% of Latter-day Saints who are between 18 and 25, so about college age, only 78% claim that they are straight. Now it's unclear from this uh, survey whether this is just active members of the church or people who are just identifying culturally as Mormon. Like you always have that mix, but you have that in, in frankly, any poll. And so here with these younger people, we see that, I mean, that's seven points lower than the Protestants. 13% of Latter-day Saints fall into the quote, something else category when it comes to their sexual orientation. Let's take a look at this chart. Even more surprising is when it comes to gender identity. Uh, they're less likely, Latter-day Saints, I should say, these young Latter-day Saints are less likely than atheists to identify as male or female. 96.8% <laughs> of these young Latter-day Saints identify as a man or woman. That's less than apparently the atheists. Another chart, only 77% of Latter-day Saints say that they are a man uh, or a woman and straight. In other words, the previous chart was about how many Latter-day Saints say that they're a man or a woman. That was 96.8%. But then we say, are you, do, you consider, do you consider yourself either a man or a woman? And are you straight? For Latter-day Saints, that number falls to 76.9%. 77%. That means that 23% uh, do not consider themselves a man or woman straight. Now, you might say, okay, this is an anomaly. This is, uh, there's, the data is probably skewed. That's not the case. Well, several years ago, another study was done, completely different data set, uh, and, and showed similar findings. About one out of every five millennial and Gen Z Latter-day Saint identified as non-straight. So when you look at the baby boomers, 94% of them said that they were uh, heterosexual or straight. But when you get to Gen Z, only 77% of Latter-day Saints self-identified as heterosexual. Let's step outside of the church for a moment and look at the broader social landscape. Uh, this matches the social trends that we see across the country. Uh, we have 7.2% of the entire U.S. population as of 2022 identifying it L as LGBT. But when you look at Gen Z, that number was 19.7%, one in five, which is very similar to the data from several years ago of Latter-day Saints showing about uh, one out of every five uh, defining themselves as non-straight. So this is a much broader trend, which uh, the nickname for this is social contagion. This concept that, you know, you watch these TikTok videos and everything, and just the cultural norms are reinforcing bisexuality and and, you know, hey, you're picked on and you're a loner. Well, hey, if you consider yourself trans, that can solve all your problems and you're, uh, you know, and you'll be accepted and, and embraced and people will love you and, you know, be an ally to you just because you jump into this gender ideology and embrace this identity. So that's social contagion. It is, it is clear that there are people who for neurochemical and, and other environmental reasons struggle with their gender from a very young age. Of course, many of these people grow out of it if you just don't chop off their sexual organs and allow them to get past puberty. But you got a lot of parents and, and a lot of incentivized people in the so-called healthcare medical industry uh, incentivized to do these surgeries, to do these hormonal treatments, to do the puberty blockers. And a lot of this is reinforced with this social contagion. Now, the question might be, could it be that this rise of younger people identifying as LGBT uh, is because we have a more affirming environment today, that it's not actually social contagion. It's just that 
people are more comfortable in their skin. They're more accepted. Therefore, we're seeing more trends from young people because the world is changing and there's just more acceptance. Uh, I've seen a lot of rebuttals to this. I have my own. I actually like this one that Matt Walsh gave uh, in testimony debunking this idea because the data clearly doesn't bear it out. Let's take a look. The number of trans identified youth has skyrocketed in recent years. We're talking about exponential 10x, 20x growth. Just huge numbers have, of, 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 uh, have, have increased. And what we hear from the pro-trans side is that, uh, well, this is not a social contagion. It's just that, you know, there's always been this many trans people. It's just that they were not in an affirming uh, environment before in history, and so they couldn't come out. And now for the first time, trans people uh, have, have the ability to live their truth, so to speak. Well, if that's the case, and there have always been these sort of like millions of trans people, and if it's also true that if we don't affirm them, that it would cause them to commit suicide, then we should be able to look back in history and find just this unbroken, incredible epidemic of children mysteriously killing themselves because they weren't being affirmed as trans. And what you find is that that didn't exist. I mean, the, the, the youth suicide rate has increased exponentially alongside trans affirmation. So trans affirmation causes the suicide rate, not the other way around. Now, in my estimation, part of the problem with this whole narrative is the fluidity of the issue. Uh, the, the very existence of the de-trans movement means that this gender identity stuff is not innate. It is not eternal. Because someone who so intently thought for years that they were, you know, they were a boy, but they felt like they were a girl or vice versa, and they were so fixated on this idea to the point of, of you know, sterilizing themselves, removing uh, your ovaries, your breasts, you know, creating a fake penis and so forth, only to then later kind of snap out of it or, or whatever, right, and suddenly realize, oh, wait, no, I am a woman, and now I've mutilated myself. The, the very fact that all these D-trans stories exist means that this is like a phase. This, this is a transitory thing for a lot of people. Maybe not for everyone. There's clearly a number of people who, you know, change or, or act as a changed gender and then stick with that for their lives, right? More power to them. But uh, the very fact that people kind of bounce back and forth shows the, the fluidity of the issue, that this is mental illness or heavily influenced by it. You know, all these stories I mentioned earlier where people were self-admitting their anxiety, their depression, their suicidal ideation, and so forth. Uh, it's social pressure. You know, ultimately, we have to come to, we have to grapple with this notion of did God get it, one's gender wrong? And, and like with abortion, right? With abortion, it's always the edge cases. Oh, but what about this random 0.001% circumstance? You know, if you want to ban abortion then you're, you know, they, they always use the exception, the, the most minute, uh, rarest of circumstances to excuse the whole, to excuse all the other baby killing that has nothing to do with these little edge cases that they put in front of you as, as the argument, right? And I think it's the same thing here with, uh, with all the trans stuff, that sure, there are some people who are born intersex and they don't have their organs and there are uh, physiological anomalies like there is in all of biology. But those edge cases, those minute and rare circumstances don't support this, this broader landscape and this ideological shift. Uh, you know, I don't think God got it wrong. And yet, yeah, there are so many people in the church, parents and siblings and friends of all these people struggling with this issue, who rather than trying to address the issue, treat the issue, uh, instead they affirm the dysphoria. They leave the church. They say the church isn't sufficiently affirming and accommodating. Therefore, I'm out of here. And and they go to this position of, like with Richard Osler, telling Lauren, you're a daughter of God. I see you how you see you. Uh, it, it's all about affirmation and not addressing the idea, the, the real issue, which is just social contagion and mental illness with so many of these situations. Again, not all. There are edge cases. There are people who have you know other deeper issues. Um, but it's certainly, I don't think, the majority of, of what we're dealing with. Now, here on the church's website about transgenderism, they have a whole page dedicated to it. Um, I think the church is exactly right with this statement they have. It says, no matter how intense your feelings of gender incongruence may be, this is just one aspect of your mortal experience. How you think about yourself may change throughout your life. Again, the fluidity of the issue. This is just one thing. It's it's transitory. We all struggle with different things. There are people who have, you know, deep-seated temptations with pornography or drugs, 
alcohol, uh, profanity, theft. I mean, everyone's struggling with different things and have different temptations, uh, but it's just one aspect of our mortal experience. So what's the concern here? What's the, what's the overarching concern? Why get your panties in a twist over this whole issue? Live and let live, let people do what they want. Um, I think ultimately this is the latest battlefront, this gender ideology issue. But, but what is the war? If this is a battlefront, what is the war? I think we are in a war against truth. We're in a war against God's plan. And I think gender ideology, broadly speaking, is a frontal assault on objective reality. It's, it's a quest to push subjective morality instead of objective morality, right? You speak your truth. Uh, you do you, right? There's no objective standard. It's, it's like that Blair Osler, the queer Mormon woman was saying, it's just like, oh, it's up to you and diverse sexual identities and fluidity and everything. Or it's like that 18 year old Beth, right? Uh, God can't be boxed in a gender and, and God is affirming and God is love. And, and so people are uh, removing themselves from any objective moral framework to one of subjectivity. Uh, it reminds me of, this is from 1984, George Orwell wrote that the party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. His heart sank as he thought of the enormous power arrayed against him, the ease with which any party intellectual would overthrow him in debate, the subtle arguments which he would not be able to understand, much less answer. And yet he was in the right. They were wrong, and he was right. The obvious, the silly, and the true had got to be defended. Freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four. If that is granted, all else follows. What's funny about this is that there's people now claiming that two plus two can equals five, right? And, and that mathematics is white supremacy and all, all this nonsense, right? But again, this notion that people are being pressured into rejecting the evidence of their eyes and ears, like in this popular video. Excuse me, it's ma'am. It is ma'am. I you need to settle down and mind your business, okay? Ma'am, once again, ma'am. No, you said, sir, once again, it's ma'am. So again, I think this is about a war on truth, a war on objective morality. It's ultimately, when you look at gender ideology and DEI and, and critical race theory and everything, this is neo-Marxism. Traditional Marxism was done through an economic framework. It was about different economic classes and seizing the means of production. Uh, but ultimately, neo-Marxism is about far broader socio-cultural institutions and not just economic institutions. But the point is the same. It's class division. It's tearing down those in power, right? It's constant chaos and warfare to try and empower the masses to overthrow those at the top. Uh, here's Jordan Peterson, spot on, saying that there is literally no bigger lie than a man can be a woman. If you'll swallow that, no future camel will choke you. That's why you're being asked to do so. You only have to sell your soul to the devil once. Again, like Orwell, we're, we're being pressured into saying things that we, d we know are true. I think of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, right? Gulag Archipelago, he's kicked out of the Soviet Union, he's sent to the West. The night before he's kicked out, he writes this amazing essay, which you should read, called Live Not by Lies. And he basically says, like, look, we're disempowered. Uh, there's not a lot we can do. This whole system is arrayed in, against us, but there is something that we can do, and that is a non-participation in lies. Live not by lies. And I think that essay, again, go read it, has significant bearing to what we're dealing with today, what George, Jordan Peterson was talking about, what Orwell was talking about, this war on truth, that if you will swallow uh, this issue and change pronouns and claim that... Uh, uh, Lauren is a daughter of God and all these things. If we go along with all of this, then how, what else are we willing to, to totally change? What else are we willing to pretend to believe that, that we know clearly is inherently untrue? We get stuff like this headline from the New York Post. Trans man discovered to be five months pregnant, making rare seahorse dad. Think about that for a second. Trans man discovered to be five months pregnant. Here's Seth Dillon from Babylon B saying simply, breaking, woman pregnant, because <laughs> that's really what it is. It's, it's a woman who is taking some hormones and maybe doing some surgical stuff, pro-dressing publicly and, and presenting as a man, 
but uh, she's ultimately a woman and it's a woman giving birth. Is this really, you know, so different a story? Now, the push to affirm or uh, accept something incongruent with doctrine, I think it's problematic, but it's seeping into the church. Here's an example from the 2021 BYU Women's Conference, uh, where Sharon Eubanks, of course, listeners of this podcast are very familiar with Miss Eubanks, Sister Eubanks, and uh, her involvement with the UN and all this garbage that uh, she's been promoting. But here she is at the Women's Conference platforming Jessica, an LGBT activist, a self-identified queer young women's president. Let's take a listen. For a long time, I felt that recognizing who I am made me broken and I was ashamed of saying it out loud I had always had those feelings but it took me about 20 years to look at myself in the mirror and say it out loud but now I know that I'm not broken I am perfect the way I am I am loved by my heavenly father of course here she's saying that she's perfect just the way she is that is false doctrine completely false, right? She is not perfect the way she is. Uh, whether you're queer or trans or an alcoholic or you're addicted to porn or you beat your wife or you you know cheated on your spouse or whatever, you are not perfect. None of us is perfect. Your decisions, your feelings are not your identity. And yet we have people being given this platform and the, these ideas seeping into the church, especially for younger people, as we see from those those polls and those surveys, that, oh, I'm perfect the way I am. God accepts me. We have a diversity and a fluidity and you do you and love is love and all these things. And, and they are unpegging themselves from the objective moral standards and the doctrine. We're going to get into just in a second what that doctrine is and could it be changing? I think we're also missing the point. I found this comment online. I found this really fascinating. I don't even remember where I, I found this. I forgot to grab the link. I think it was on Facebook. Uh, so I'm going to read this quote from this person uh, who was talking about how they think that the church is kind of missing the point right now regarding this whole issue. Here's the quote. In the recent Utah area conference, the area presidency spoke, and one of the members focused on how bad racism is and how you can't say you don't support teachings opposed to the church if you are racist. She continues, I, lit I was literally screaming at my phone because if I asked all the members of the church I know, not a single one would say that racism is okay. But in the meantime, if I ask those same people about this, this being all this LGBT stuff, I think 30 to 40 percent would say that supporting LGBTQ ideology is totally fine. I do not know how to not feel completely lost when the area presidency is focusing on a topic that maybe impacts 0.5 percent of members in Utah. While a pernicious and evil ideology rages through the land, leading the souls of the children of men down to hell with niceness and good intentions. Okay, so here's Spencer Kimball. Uh, he says, some people are ignorant or vicious and apparently attempting to destroy the concept of masculinity and femininity. More and more girls dress, groom, and act like men. More and more men dress, groom, and act like women. This is half a century ago, mind you. The high purposes of life are damaged and destroyed by the growing unisex theory. God made man in his own image, male and female made he them. With relatively few accidents of nature, again, there's always edge cases, we are born male or female. The Lord knew best. Certainly men and women who would change their sex status will answer to their maker. So what is the church's position on all this? What is the policy? What is the doctrine? Is it changing? To that, we can look to, among other places, the handbook. Now, in the 1980 version of the handbook, it said that members who have undergone transsexual operations must be excommunicated. And that after excommunication, such a person is not eligible for baptism. More recently, in the new update to the handbook, there's a very lengthy portion dealing with transgender individuals, which says, in part, transgender individuals face complex challenges. Members and non-members who identify as transgender and their family and friends should be treated with sensitivity, kindness, compassion, and an abundance of Christ-like love. All are welcome to attend sacrament meeting, other Sunday meetings, and social events of the church. Absolutely. We should be kind. We should be love. We should be sensitive about the whole situation. But they say gender is an essential characteristic of Heavenly Father's plan of happiness. The intended meaning of gender in the family proclamation is 
not what people perceive, not what they claim. Here they, they say it is biological sex at birth. Some people experience feelings of incongruence between their biological sex and their gender identity. As a result, they may identify as transgender. The church does not take a position on the causes of people identifying as transgender. Most church participation and some priesthood ordinances are gender neutral. Transgender persons may be baptized and confirmed as outlined in this other section of the handbook. They may also partake of the sacrament and receive priesthood blessings. However, priesthood ordination and temple ordinances are received according to biological sex at birth. Church leaders counsel against, mind you, it doesn't say that they prohibit, they counsel against elective medical or surgical intervention for the purpose of attempting to transition to the opposite gender of a person's biological sex at birth. Leaders advise that taking these actions will be cause, so here's, this is more mandatory now, will be cause for church membership restrictions. Leaders also counsel against, but not prohibit, the counsel against social transitioning. A social transition includes changing dress or grooming or changing a name or pronouns to present oneself as other than his or her biological sex at birth. Leaders advise that those who socially transition will experience church membership restrictions for the duration of this transition. Okay, so it goes on. Uh, this last little part I'll read, it says that if a member decides to change his or her preferred name or pronouns of address, the name preference may be noted in the preferred name field on the membership record. The person may be addressed by the preferred name in the ward. Okay, there's a little bit of stuff to unpack here because uh, Emmett, you know, she given the example where her record still said female, though she wanted it to say male because she was presenting as a man. And so here in the handbook, uh, it's not talking about that issue about changing the actual gender marker on the record, much like Lauren claiming that he's in fact listed as a woman. That isn't here in the handbook and it doesn't, I couldn't find anything about the protocol of how to deal with transgender people about what gender you actually list on their record. Instead, this is more talking about your, your, your preference of how you want to be called. Now, interestingly here, there is no preferred pronouns field. Uh, there's only a preferred name field, much like if someone has a nickname. So the church apparently is taking like the traditional nickname field that a lot of forums have and calling that a preferred name. And so if, if I'm born Connor, but I want to be called Anita, then in my preferred name field, they can put Anita, which, you know, might as well be a nickname or something. But it apparently they don't have preferred pronouns field. It doesn't say members should or will use preferred pronouns. It just says that the person may be addressed by their preferred name in the ward. It doesn't say to call a man an address sister, right? It's not getting, uh, not getting into any of that. Now, as of 2019, in Handbook 1, which was the, the handbook for, for state presidents and bishops, it said that persons who are considering, uh, a person who's considering an elective transsexual operation may not be baptized or confirmed. Baptism and confirmation of a person who has already undergone an elective transsexual operation require the approval of the First Presidency. That was what happened in Lauren's case. The mission president may request this approval if he has interviewed the person, found him or her to be otherwise worthy, and can recommend baptism. However, such persons may not uh, receive the priesthood or temple recommend. So this is, again, this is what happened in Lauren's case. But again, there's there's disparity here. It's just like, oh, good, I got mine taken care of before I found the church. Or, um, oh, I'm, I'm going to stop uh, investigating the church for now. I'm going to go do, you know, my surgery and my transition and everything, and then I'll, I'll join the church. I'm going to keep you at arm's length until I do that, because then I'll get different benefits and different treatment. Now, the church has has tried to carefully navigate the the issue of homosexuality over time you know making it not an issue of how you feel but it's about how you act the church is no not punishing feelings uh mental issues people's uh innate or inborn desires they claim to have uh, but instead it's all about the homosexual activity and that's when the restrictions and the problems come in and and so the, dividing that between thoughts and actions i think that's a reasonable boundary as it pertains to the homosexual issue the issue is that the trans issue uh, blows that position up completely, right? Because it's no longer about thoughts versus behavior. For trans people, their thoughts is what your behavior must change to accept, right? It's insufficient to just let them be content in their thoughts and, and 
think that, you know, I'm a man, but I think I'm a woman. No, it's, it's an outward imposition on other people as to how they should not only behave, but also think. You know, many, many people, I think, are placing their hope in change rather than their hope in Christ. Uh, what I mean by that is there's a lot of people, including the church, who feel like, you know, the policies are going to change. We just need to wait this out. Notwithstanding statements to the contrary, which we'll get into in just a second. Um, I, I said before, I think, you know, if a man who puts on a dress and lipstick and says he's a woman uh, wants to attend Relief Society, is that fair to the women in Relief Society? It's not fair to women to have their spaces taking, uh, taken away to make another individual going through mental issues feel validated or, or feel comfortable. Uh, we can respect people. We can love them. Uh, but the truth should be something that we can embrace in church and not have this confusion seep in. Of all places, the church should boldly stand for what is true and real, objective morality, and not all this subjectivity. Uh, Christ, I think, doesn't affirm illness, mental or physical. He heals it. Uh, and, you know, the, it's interesting, in the church's page on transgenderism, the very last section is all about depression, anxiety, suicide. There's just this, like, final portion making kind of clear to me that so much of this is about uh, mental illness. And then just like Lauren was asked about the resurrection, like, did God get it wrong? Does someone who chopped off their body parts and took some uh, drugs, are they uh, going to be resurrected as the gender that they're trying to, to act as? Uh, you know, if, if someone has all this mental illness, but then they later find out because everyone's going to get resurrected, oh, shucks, I was, I was wrong. I actually was a man or, you know, whatever. It's just, it's super confusing with, without very clear uh, positions and statements. Now, you might say in, in response, well, Connor, like there have been clear messages and statements. The, we do have responses from our church. I'll share a few in just a moment. You're not wrong in part. But as I said, a lot of people have hope in change. They're thinking that they can just wait this out, that church leaders will change. And among other things, they look to the issue of blacks and the priesthood. Right where for so long leaders of the church claimed that uh, it was a doctrinal issue. Here's Brigham Young teaching that black men would not receive the priesthood until all the other descendants of Adam have received the promises and enjoyed the blessings of the priesthood and the true keys thereof. He taught that the restriction was a true eternal principle the Lord Almighty has ordained. The first presidency in 1949, a century later, said that the attitude of the church with reference to the Negroes, remains as it has always stood. It is not a matter of the declaration of a policy, but of direct commandment from the Lord, on which is founded the doctrine of the church from the days of its organization to the effect that Negroes may become members of the church, but that they are not entitled to the priesthood at the present time. That sounds very like the trans uh, policy right now. The prophets of the Lord have made several statements as to the operation of the principle President Brigham Young said, Why are so many of the inhabitants of the earth cursed with a skin of blackness? It comes in consequence of their fathers rejecting the power of the holy priesthood and the law of God. They will go down to death. That was 1949 First Presidency. Uh, today, that is not the position of the church. The position is that this was a policy, that there was no doctrinal basis, that, you know, that it never really was from God. People don't know why it started or what happened, but it's just this policy and it changed through this revelation from God. But these earlier leaders are making clear that it, from their vantage point, this was doctrine. They were teaching it as doctrine, this immutable eternal law. Here's the first presidency 20 years later, 1969. Our loving prophet, President David O. McKay, has said, The seeming discrimination by the church toward the Negro is not something which originated with man, but goes back into the beginning with God. Revelation assures us that this plan antedates man's mortal existence, extending back to man's pre-existing state. Just a few years later, President Kimball says that the issue it was not my policy or the church's policy. It is the policy of the Lord who has established it. Of course, it was just five years later that the revelation is received to knock it off, to stop restricting black people, to give the priesthood to everybody who's worthy. And so then you have Bruce R. McConkie, Bruce McConkie, who gets up and says, and I quote, forget everything that I have said or what President Brigham Young or President George Q. Cannon or whomsoever has said in days past that is contrary to present revelation. We spoke with a limited understanding and without the light and knowledge that now has come to the world. 
And so you have people like Jim Bennett. Many of my listeners may not know who he is, but he's a, kind of an online troll, the son of the former Senator Bennett, and uh, wrote a great response to the CES letter. So he's a, he's in the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, but he's kind of an online troll and uh, kind of a liberal guy. And he was on Ward Radio, a, a, another podcast a couple of weeks ago, saying that we are going to get more light and knowledge on this topic, right? Contrast that against Elder McConkey saying, we were operating before under limited light and knowledge. Forget everything you said. Forget all those claims that it was doctrine. Forget all the statements. Forget all the firm, immutable, eternal teachings. Instead, we now have new light and knowledge. And so you have people like Bennett and others who say, oh, we're just waiting for more light and knowledge. We think that the Lord is going to give us more, that the current positions are going to change. So again, there's this hope in change. There's this, uh, this idea that unchangeable doctrine is all changeable. Just give it time and create enough pressure so leaders feel that they have to take the question and go to the Lord like they did with blacks in the priesthood. And then, aha, they get a revelation and things change. There's a lot of people who feel this way. Here's Dallin Oaks, 1988. He's saying this about race, but it applies to gender. He said, I don't know that it's possible to distinguish between policy and doctrine in a church that believes in continuing revelation and sustains its leader as a prophet. I'm not sure I could justify the difference in doctrine and policy in the fact that before 1978, a person could not hold the priesthood, and after 1978, they could hold the priesthood. Wow. This, this statement is basically saying that in a church that has continuing revelation, there is no substantive difference between policy and doctrine, that policy and doctrine are distinctions without a difference. That's a significant statement, especially because so often these issues are claimed to be policy. But here's Elder Oaks, now President Oaks, saying there is no difference. There is no policy that doesn't have a doctrinal basis and a divine connection and authorization and so forth. Um, and yet here's President Oaks in October of 2023. Let's take a listen. A uniquely valuable teaching to help us prepare for exaltation is the 1995 Proclamation on the Family. Its declarations clarify the requirements that prepare us to live with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ. Those who do not fully understand the Father's loving plan for His children may consider this family proclamation no more than a changeable statement of policy. In contrast, we affirm that the family proclamation, founded on irrevocable doctrine, defines the mortal family relationship where the most important part of our eternal development can occur. Okay, so again, what is he saying? The, there are some people who think that the family proclamation is no more than a changeable statement of policy. In contrast, we affirm it's founded on irrevocable doctrine. So, so in 1988, when it comes to race, he's saying, well, there is no difference between policy uh, and doctrine. And now he's saying there's some people who think this is just a policy, but it is uh, irrevocable doctrine. Yet many people with blacks in the priesthood claim that it was, you know, essentially irrevocable doctrine. Uh, the first presidency, including Oaks, I should point out in 2019, this was when they were announcing that the kids of LGBT individuals could get baptized, reversing their previous policy slash doctrine, uh, saying, and I quote again, the first presidency, these changes do not represent a shift in church doctrine related to marriage or the commandments of God in regard to chastity and morality. The doctrine of the plan of salvation and the importance of chastity will not change. Again, like Oaks. A revocable doctrine. This isn't going to change. It's not going to change. Well, up until the point that it does change, if in fact it does. You know, there are many people who think that doctrine is fluid and they look to the issue of blacks in the priesthood. Thanks, Brigham, for, you know, screwing all this up. They look to that issue as their justification to say that doctrine is in fact fluid and that God's eternal laws aren't actually eternal. Here's the aforementioned Jim Bennett on Twitter saying that either you believe in continuing revelation or you believe in doctrine that can never change. You can't believe both at the same time. Here's Brother Bennett, member of the Motab and everything else, considering himself, you know, this great Latter-day Saint uh, championing this issue like Osler and all these other guys. What's he saying? He's effectively saying that the first presidency 
uh, doesn't believe in continuing revelation. That is the logical conclusion of his statement, right? He says, either you believe in continuing revelation, which allows this stuff to be changed, or you believe in doctrine that can never change. And yet the first presidency themselves said that this doctrine of the plan of salvation, the importance of chastity will not change. Oaks said it's a revocable doctrine. All these guys are saying, not going to change, not going to change. And yet you have people in the church like Bennett who are saying, well, then you don't believe in continuing revelation, <laughs> including saying that to the first presidency. So what is this doctrine that many feel could be changeable policy? Well, uh, let's start here. All human beings, male and female, are created in the image of God. It each is a beloved spirit son or daughter of heavenly parents, and as such, each has a divine nature and destiny. Gender is an essential characteristic of individual premortal, mortal, and eternal identity and purpose. Or we could go to uh, Elder Bednar, who said that for divine purposes, male and female spirits are different, distinctive, and complementary. The unique combination of spiritual, physical, mental, and emotional capacities of both males and females were needed to implement the plan of happiness. He further said that our gender, in large measure, defines who we are, why we are here on this earth, and what we are all to do and become. Uh, here's Elder Ballard. The premortal and mortal natures of men and women were specified by the Lord Jehovah himself. Well, of course, previously, leaders uh, talked about pre-mortal unrighteousness affecting blacks. So could they be wrong here, too? That's an open question for an increasing number of Latter-day Saints. Uh, here's Elder Ballard again. Our Heavenly Father created both women and men who are his spirit, daughters, and sons. This means that gender is eternal. And then here's another clip from Elder Scott singing the same tune. Scriptures record, and I, God, created man. Male and female created I them. This was done spiritually in your premortal existence when you lived in the presence of your Father in heaven. Your gender existed before coming to earth. On another occasion, Elder Oaks said that the binary creation of male and female is essential to the plan of salvation. Again, this idea that the doctrine isn't going to change, is not going to change. Uh, then you have all these people in the church feeling like, yeah, you know, it might change. Elder Renlund said that male and female spirits were created to complement each other. That is why gender is not fluid in the eternities, because it provides the basis for the ultimate gift Heavenly Father can give his kind of life. I have many more quotes I could continue to share. I'll stop it there. Uh, and, and so we have so many issues of confusion. You've got, most recently, Charlie Bird, who is a, uh, a gay member of the church. He was Cosmo Cougar, became a little bit of an influencer, celeb within some young Mormon circles, wrote a book with Deseret Book about LGBT stuff. Uh, now he is married to a man. He uh, apparently continues to attend his ward, takes the sacrament, uh, and apparently confirmed by other people in the stake, is listed in the church records in LDS tools as being married to a man, much like Lauren is saying that he is listed as a female. And so I, I won't get into it for time, but I have all these handbook references right here talking about uh, how uh, the church leaders are supposed to deal with people who are in a form of marriage like Charlie, uh, who are, uh, that it's not between a man or a woman, saying that a church membership council may be necessary, um, that for people who are temple endowed and living in transgression, that a disciplinary council must be held. Uh, there's all these handbook issues that both kind of require discipline and, and these councils to be held and membership restrictions to potentially be withheld or giving discretion and saying it may be necessary. Multiple references in the handbook saying, you know, it may be necessary if X, Y, and Z relating to all these like trans and, and uh, LGBT type of issues. The problem here is Bishop Roulette. If you've got an affirming bishop, they're going to be like, yeah, you're good. Keep coming. Keep taking the sacrament. We'll, you know, put you in the church records this way. And, and we want you at church, you know, and, and we'll affirm you and accommodate you. And then you have maybe other hardliners or other uh, bishops who feel differently. And so you have this total 
uh, confusion about the guidelines, this permissiveness that seeps into the church. Uh, and so, you know, you have different standards, again, for Emmett versus Lauren, uh, someone who wants to transition while a member, someone who transitioned before they were a member. Uh, ultimately, I think when we talk about gender wars in the church, we need to figure out, will the church withstand this, this massive social pressure? It could very well be because of the, the broader implications of this ideological battle for truth, for reality of what your eyes can see and what your ears can hear, that this could be among the issues that divide the wheat from the tares, that, that really divide the church. People who want to be loving and affirming and accommodating and take on what President Hinckley called the slow stain of the world, right, versus, and, and you know, affirming all the, the mental illness and all the problems that are kind of wrapped up in this, versus you know, people who are standing for what they claim to be unchangeable doctrine, despite many other people claiming that all doctrine is changeable, that everything is fluid, that everything is up to revision. And, and you know, they've got examples like the blacks and the priesthood, which that was claimed to be, you know, doctrine. And doctrine is, you know, God is the same yesterday and today and forever. Therefore, why would it change? And, the, oh, well, now it changed. We have a new reality. So these people kind of hope and expect that, eh, well, current members and leaders of the church grew up in a time when this was not accepted. And so we just need to wait for more of them to die off. Right. And then we'll have some new leaders called who are more loving and affirming. And then the policies will change and the doctrine will change. And, oh, would you look at that? We all prayed about it and got this new revelation. So suddenly everything we said before, like McConkie said regarding blacks and the priesthood, don't pay any attention to it because now we have more light and knowledge. This is a tough issue for the church affected in part by the Brigham Youngs of the world and their ridiculous issues with the restrictions on blacks. Joseph, of course, didn't restrict the blacks. Elijah Abel and others had access to the priesthood, uh, though they were black. And so you have, uh, we're, we're dealing with the ramifications of these earlier policy positions being justified publicly, like polygamy, a huge one, being justified as doctrinal, and it creates all this, this collateral damage in its wake and confusion uh, with the members of the church. So this is a big issue. You, Yes, we should be sensitive and loving and kind. I'm not saying we should be jerks to any of these people. I'm not saying that, that they should be targeted or oppressed in any kind of way. But ultimately, people who have eyes and ears should be able to live in accordance with what reality clearly is. We should embrace objective morality, not subject, uh, subjective morality. And loving other people does not require affirming their delusions or fantasies or mental illness or desires or anything else. Uh, again, we don't need to be unkind about it, but we can very simply say, I I'm sorry, I'm not going to, you know, use your preferred pronouns. I'm not going to say that you are a daughter of God, even though you're a man and so on and so forth. Uh, there's a balance to be had. It is a tricky issue, uh, no doubt. Uh, and people under significant social pressure like this often buckle because they don't want to be hated. They don't want to be canceled. They don't want to be rejected. They don't want to be unliked. Uh, and, and so this is a tough issue. It could divide the church significantly, especially if there isn't more clarity from the top, especially as it pertains to this bishop roulette issue and how local leaders are accommodating and affirming individuals navigating this landscape, which is just going to increase over time as younger members of the church get older to the extent they stay in the church and not leave. Big issue, tough issue. This issue is not going away. Uh, but like any war, you ultimately have to choose what side you're on. This is a battle, I think, for truth, for objective morality, um, for being able to live in harmony with uh, at least what we understand to be immutable, irrevocable doctrine uh, and gender's relation to the overall plan of salvation. Uh, this is a, a big battle that we're navigating. A lot of casualties are happening. Um, but ultimately we need to pick which side we're on and stand our ground and, uh, stand up for truth. See you next Sunday.